Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. Later in the episode, you'll hear my interview with Doris Kearns Goodwin, author of the new book, Leadership in Turbulent Times. I spoke to Doris just before the election, and we've saved this interview just for you for Thanksgiving. Exciting stuff. Um, but Do you for- think Doris Kearns Goodwin is disappointed that Ron Chernow got the nod over her to speak at the White House Correspondence Center this year? I was just telling Lovett that he should write a comedy speech for Ron Chernow just to foil the best laid plans of the White House Correspondents Association. <laughs> Ron, Ron, Ron Chernow is a great writer and a great historian, but he doesn't scream fun Saturday night to me. Right, which is what they wanted, but I think we should just uh, upend the whole thing and he should just tell a bunch of jokes. Um, but first, we're going to do our annual Thanksgiving mailbag. This is now our tradition, Dan, that you and I do every I mean, it's Thanksgiving. It's our second time, I guess, <laughs> our third time. I feel like we might have done it in the Keeping It 1600 days, maybe. Yeah, I think that's right. But I can't quite remember. Um, <laughs> I, I've blocked out most of those days. Right, Like, I'm too. aware we had a podcast. Yeah. Not sure we said anything. We didn't make any predictions. <laughs> Just wipe it from your mind, people. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's dig into the mailbag here. Thank you all, by the way, for submitting so many questions on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, all over the place. Um, We will start with Teresa Molina, who asks, how does John view 2018 through the lens of the wilderness? What mistakes did Dems repeat? What did they get right? Did they show evidence of learning lessons and taking a new direction? You've all heard this because we've talked about it a million times, but the wilderness was the uh, the series that uh, I did on the history and future of the Democratic Party. Um, yeah, I thought that Democrats, uh, learned a lot of lessons since 2016. And, you know, a lot of that lesson learning happened, uh, in the days and weeks after 2016. Uh, I think that we recruited some outstanding candidates in 2018, especially younger candidates, women, people of color. It was a more diverse field. They didn't come from the typical backgrounds of, uh, your normal candidates that we recruit often. That was one of the messages out of the wilderness. Um, I think the party had, very good message discipline, uh, focusing on healthcare and pre-existing conditions. Um, I think we learned how to be a big tent party. Uh, there were folks from, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Joe Manchin uh, that we ran. And, you know, there were some debates and fights that played out over the course of 2018, but nothing so bad as to really hurt the party uh, in the fall. Um, I think we learned to focus more on down ballot races, investing in state parties, sort of returning the center of power in the Democratic Party back to the grassroots. And um, I think some candidates like Beto O'Rourke relied more on digital organizing and less on traditional media. So they thought that was good, too. Um, In the mistakes category, uh, I don't know if we made any big mistakes, but I still think we probably need to be less afraid and more confident in our immigration messaging. Um, I think we still need to be talking about a bolder economic agenda in 2020. And I'm sure you agree on this one, but I'd like to hear more from you on this. Um, I still think we probably need a a sharper media strategy, uh, a way to figure out how to break through the clutter of the current media environment and get our message out directly to voters. Uh, What do you think, Dan? I mean, let's stipulate that the Democrats did a phenomenal job. Mm. We won races up and down the ballot. We picked up more than 350 legislative seats. We picked up governorships. We did a great job. So the things I'm about to say are not – this is not raining on the parade that we should still be having from the election. It's more to point out the things we have to improve upon to win in 2020 because 2020 is going to be much harder because you will be actually running against Trump. And the problem – it is Democrats, as you point out, did a great job with message discipline by focusing on <clears throat> health care and the Republican tax cut plan and ignoring Trump. It's just a lot harder to ignore Trump when you are running against Trump and when he is on the ballot. And presidential races drive everything in a presidential year, right? How our Democratic nominee handles Trump is going to impact as perhaps as much as anything else the things that drive gubernatorial races and Senate races and House races. So we really have to figure that piece out and improve upon it and and do it creatively. I think the other – we should also just recognize that 
we had every we had a lot of things going in our direction here, right? We had the momentum. We had this was the first midterm of a pre- presidential, which often goes well for us. And we, and the question for the party is, and, and knowing that the party did a very very good job, we did a great job recruiting candidates. We did a great job organizing. We did a great job funding candidates. We expanded the playing field. And the habit sometimes the Democratic Party is when we were at when we're at bottom, we do a lot of things right, and then. Once we get to a better position, we sort of relax. We stop investing in down ballot races. We we return to some of our old habits. Yeah, I think that's kind of what happened in 2016, and the hope is we're going to make sure that doesn't happen in 2020. We have to focus on coming up with new new tools and new strategies that reflect the modern age of politics. Too many of we won despite this fact in 2018, but too many of our campaigns look just like the campaigns of 2016. Yeah, huge emphasis on television advertising, direct mail, and not enough ever, not enough focus on digital advertising, digital organizing, and the candidates that you highlight, Beto, obviously has been talked about most, but there were others who did a really good job around digital communications, digital organizing, and we are going to have to build on that in 2020 if we want to have a chance to beat Trump because Trump, look, he got an assist from Jim Comey, he got assist from the Russians, he. Barely won, but he did reimagine. He didn't do all the same things that Democratic that he didn't do all the same things that presidential candidates typically do. He spent less money on TV. He spent a lot of money on digital. Yeah. He thought he did very clever experimentation on digital, where they were testing dozens, if not hundreds, of messages at a time, and then doubling downs on the ones that were showing the most response. So it's like pretty clever things, and we're gonna have to up our game if we're going to defeat that, in part because Trump did that at a financial disadvantage last time. And in 2020, he's going to have a massive financial advantage because all of those billionaires who sat out 2016 because they thought Trump was going to lose now have their giant, massive tax cut on the line. They're going to be pouring money into helping Trump. So he's going to have he will be able to have the ability to massively outspend the Democratic nominees. So we're going to have to be smarter and more efficient than we've ever been in the past. Yes. Yes, we will. Um, second question comes from Emerson Betcher, um, who says, Wisconsin, let's talk about the Tammy Baldwin and Scott Walker voters. What's up with that? Tammy won by a reasonable margin and Scott lost such a tiny margin. Uh, who are those people in the middle? Do they just like incumbents? How do they view Tammy's job differently than Scott's? What do you think, Dan? <laughs> that is a great question that we're going to be forced basically to speculate on because unless you go back and... I you know do sort of a regression poll and see get talk to people who actually were those voters. Mm. You don't really know, but I will make some guesses. One is it's a dwindling group, but there still are a group of people who go back and forth between parties in between elections. And in our split ticket voters, right? There is a reason that there is a that there are states with Democratic senators and Republican governors mm-hmm. and. Republican governors and Democratic senators, right? Yep. And so, like, that does happen. It's it's fewer and fewer. I think what helped Tammy Baldwin is, one, she is very progressive, but she she ran everywhere, and she gave it in the state of Wisconsin, campaigned hard in red areas, rural areas, exurban areas. But she also had – the other th- reason that I think some of these voters might have been willing to support Walker, which – I can't even fathom that because I think Scott Walker is <laughs> terrible. Um, so terrible he couldn't even beat Jeb Bush or Ben Carson in the 2016 Republican presidential primary. But the argument that Dem- that you needed a check on Trump is, I think, why you w- why- is why someone might consider voting for their Republican governor but having a Democratic senator. That's interesting. I also think you know incumbency matters less and is mattering less with each cycle. But, um, you know, Tammy Baldwin was a more known quantity than Tony Evers, who won the governorship. So you could see some people because they recognize Tammy Baldwin. Again, these are like, you know, sort of voters who are moderate, independent. Maybe they don't vote very often, but they recognize Tammy Baldwin. They've seen her around and maybe they don't know uh, Tony Evers as much. So I do incumbency probably matters a little bit, too. And look, I mean, uh, in situations like this. Uh, things other than partisanship and ideology matter to people sometimes. Candidate quality matters. Um, you know, positions on various issues matter or, or in terms of like what those candidates are talking about on the campaign trail. So like you said, we can't know for sure, but there are a few possible factors at play there. 
Um, and it's it's worth spending time trying to understand these voters, right? So you also have in a similar situation in Ohio where you have Sherrod Bra- people who voted for Sherrod Brown for Senate and Mike DeWine for governor. Right. And like understanding – same thing in – uh, in some of these other states, right? And I mean, there are people who were DeSantis Nelson voters in Florida. In, te- in Texas, and there were there were four hundred thousand people in Texas who voted for Beto O'Rourke for Senate and Greg Abbott for governor. Yeah. And the and the reason we need to understand these these voters is in states, particularly in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, these are the voters that we need them to be in the Democratic column in 2020 if we want to win those states. The fact that we lost some of those voters in 2016 was one of the major factors contributing to Democratic struggles in traditionally blue Midwestern states. Yep. How will the passage of Amendment 4 in Florida change the electorate? Are the now eligible voters likely Democrats or Republicans? Also, how likely are they to vote? Um, Just for some context here, in 2016... More than 418,000 African Americans out of a voting age population of more than 2.3 million, or 17.9% of the potential, uh, potential black voters in Florida, had finished sentences but couldn't vote due to a felony record, according to the Sentencing Project. Um, and um, Mark Meredith of the University of Pennsylvania and Michael Morse at Yale and Harvard, they did some work on this, and they wrote for Vox, had all ex-felons been eligible to vote in Florida in 2016, we estimate that this would have generated about 102,000 additional votes for Democrats and about 54,000 additional votes for Republicans, with about an additional 40,000 votes that could be cast on behalf of either party. So that adds up to about 48,000 votes on net for Democrats. Um, what do you think about this, Dan? Huge, you know, obviously it's, first of all, it's one of the best, thing that's, the best things that happened um, on election night just because it's the right thing to have happened. Um, you know, whether yes. whether these people who have been formerly incarcerated vote Democrat or Republican, the fact that they have the right to vote now is just a good thing and it is the right thing to do. Um, but beyond that, obviously, there are political implications. Yeah, it's I think that it there are a lot of people running around saying if this if you know, now that this amendment's passed, Florida is a blue state. And that is dangerously naive in my view. Certainly there is a lar- there is a slightly larger pool of potential Democratic voters than newly potential Republican voters who are available. And Florida is a state that is deciding elections right now by less than, you know, a half of 1%. So everything can be decisive, right? And so if Democrats are successful in turning out this new population of potential Democratic voters at a rate that somewhat nears how well they're turning out other voters, then if, if that were the case now, then Andrew Gillum would be governor and Bill Nelson would still be in the Senate. And so I think it, it, it matters. We need every little bit of help we can. It's going to take a lot of work to get these people registered and turned out. And the But this idea that it somehow is going to fundamentally change the direction of politics in Florida, I think, overstates the case. Yeah. Although, as we saw, you know, with the margins that we the, – with the margins that we saw on Tuesday – um, it won't change the overall direction of politics, but it certainly matters in close races, you know. Yeah, like if someone had, well, so everything matters. Like if someone in, in Broward County could design a fucking ballot that made sense, Bill Nelson would still be in the Senate. It is just, not as if ballot just, design issues have never have have never happened in Florida before since ballot design issues are why George W. Bush became president. There's just no excuse for that. Look, so I know that each state runs their own, uh, you know, election system, but isn't there a way that like someone could? introduce or propose sort of like a universal ballot design for the whole country that's easy and simple that maybe states that like it can all adopt like isn't that something we can do i don't know there there are federal recommendations on how you do this i am told um unfortunately uh broward county chose to to do it in a very weird way and knuckleheads sadly uh the florida democratic party signed off on the ballot as is is, i believe so cool cool that's not great um okay mb holm 02 asks how do we prevent the democratic presidential field in 2020 from being like the republicans in 2016 or is there not an equivalent of trump on the left to worry about what do you think dan (laughs) <laughs> you, you, there is not the one. equivalent of Trump on the left to worry about. <laughs> I, I I take a different view. I think maybe I think you and I probably take the same view, but a different view than a lot of people in Democratic politics right now who are 
sort of panicking about the si- the size of the field. And part of that is based on looking at the Republican process in 2016 that led to, had a thousand candidates and led to Trump and the Democratic process in 2016, which was a long and at times brutal primary that had bad feelings that lingered for a long time. I do not – I worry about everything. That's you know, the the new motto for Democrats. Worry about is, everything. Is, I don't tell people not to want to bet anymore. I say worry about everything, panic about nothing. Mm. And I don't worry about this too much because I think a big field will engender the best debate that we as a party need to have on policy, message, and strategy. I do too. I also don't think there is an equivalent of Trump on the left – That we have to worry about. (laughs) I mean, Trump was also one of the ways that Trump was unique is that um, even though he was sort of laughed off at the beginning by us, by many people um, in the early months of that campaign, um, he's also someone with, you know, almost universal name ID. (laughs) Everyone knew who he was. Um, He is a billionaire. So he started with a set of advantage. In addition to being a a complete asshole, which he has turned out to be, he has he has kept that promise. Um, You know, he was also a a billionaire, or you know, who knows how rich he is, um, with uh, who is famous. And uh, so far, knock on wood, we haven't had any truly asshole famous billionaires on the left, (laughs) uh, like Trump. Who've decided to throw their hat in the ring? Maybe that changes. Maybe that changes. But for now, when you look at the field, you don't see any uh, Trump-like figures um, with that kind of recognition. The way, the completely ass-backwards way in which most people in politics uh, view the 2016 Republican presidential primary is that this giant field of many, many candidates, all qualified. Um, the leading lights of the Republican Party, this giant field, allowed this up-and-comer who come out of nowhere and win the election. That is horseshit. As you point out, Trump had 100% name ID. He was leading in the polls when he got in the race. And in public and private polling back in 2011, when he was on his birther crusade, he was leading the Republican primary then for the race he eventually decided not to get into. So he has been a... Someone the Republican Party base has been interested in being their standard bearer for a very long time. And so the problem wasn't that there were a lot of Republicans running that allowed Trump to win. The problem is that the Republicans running were terrible at running campaigns, and therefore Trump was able to win. Uh, Amber Larson asks, why is Iowa so important? You've said it many times in the pod, and I would love more information. Happy Thanksgiving, friends. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Amber. Um, Iowa is important because it is the first state that holds a primary contest. It is a caucus in Iowa. And um, traditionally, because it gets so much attention, because every candidate goes there and, you know, many of them visit all 99 counties um, and they get to meet voters up close and the voters get to sort of, as Obama used to say, uh, kick the tires a little bit on all the candidates. Um there's all this drama around the Iowa caucuses so that when whoever wins and often uh, the people who come in second candidates who come in second as well, get this huge boost of momentum uh, headed into the New Hampshire primary, which is usually the next contest and also incredibly important. So because there's so much media attention on Iowa and then New Hampshire, the winners of those uh, contests, especially in a crowded field, um, get enough attention, momentum, you know, fundraising, all this kind of stuff um, that as they go on, as we start going on to all the other contests, primary contests, um, it starts to usually winnow down the field of candidates. Um, Although, you know, this could be changing. Do you think, do you think that's changing at all, Dan? No. Um, The Democrat, the person, the Democrat who has won the Iowa caucuses has become the nominee in every recent election other than 1992 when Iowa was non-competitive because then Iowa Senator Tom Harkin was running for president, so all the candidates Mm. decided to take a pass on it. But Al Gore won, Barack Obama won, Hillary Clinton won, John Kerry won. All of those candidates went on to be the nominee. Mm. And there's an I think that that will remain true, although it's a little more complicated now because 
uh, California has moved up in the presidential primary process, Woo! and that's a large chunk of delegates to any candidate who can win that by a decent margin. But the other thing about Iowa is it's a caucus, not a primary. And so you're not asking, you're not organizing to get someone to vote for you. You're organizing someone to go to a gym or a church or a community center on a weeknight where it is freezing fucking cold and usually snowing and to stay, stay in that gym for two to three hours and engage it, not just to vote for you, but to engage in a public debate about who they're supporting until the delegates for that caucus site are allocated. It's a very complicated process. And because of that, it is therefore a gigantic test of a candidate campaign's ability to organize and run a real campaign. And so it does separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to who's running a real campaign and who's running sort of a bullshit uh, publicity ride. Yeah. And it also sort of uh, like we knew in 2007 um, when we were like 15, 20 points behind Hillary in the national polls that we still had a chance to win the nomination because if Obama could just focus on Iowa and win Iowa, then all these national polls showing him 10 points behind Hillary wouldn't matter as much because he would get so much momentum from winning Iowa that it would take care of the rest, which is exactly what happened. Um, so That's Iowa true. also like gives candidates a chance who might not have the organization, the money, the endorsements of the front runner to really make a stand. Um, okay, John Fogarty asks, if Beto doesn't run in 2020, does he risk falling into the Chris Christie trap of losing momentum? Chris Christie. <laughs> New- yes, Beto. If you do not run for president, you will find yourself in just a few years fetching McDonald's <laughs> for some person who does not like you and is really publicly mean to you. So think it. So as you ponder the various paths your life could take in the coming months, consider the example of Chris Christie. Time for some traffic or in El Paso. Consider the example of Marco Rubio, who chose not to run for president in 2012, and then he became such a national laughingstock that he lost his own home state to Donald Trump. And and Marco Rubio could be last seen tweeting 68 times about how Democratic lawyers were trying to steal an election in Florida. <laughs> look look what he's been reduced to now. Um. But yeah, I mean, to be serious about this, I don't think um, I don't think he runs ever runs better O'Rourke ever runs the risk of uh, becoming Chris Christie. Um, but I do think, in all seriousness, there is a moment, there is a window for each candidate um, to run for president. And like I know that, at least I believe that in two thousand and eight, Barack Obama really, um, at least when I got to the Senate in two thousand and five. He genuinely didn't think he would run for president, and in uh, he, in two thousand and eight at least. And as he was trying to make that decision and figure out whether he did want to run two thousand eight, as two thousand six, two thousand seven rolled around, um, you know, I think one of the pieces of advice he got was, you know, you are people are looking to you right now. Um, you have a lot of popularity right now, and there is a moment, there's a window for you to run this election. And if you miss that window, it may not happen again. Um, what do you think about that? I, I 100% agree with that. And presidential campaigns are about a match between a person and the moment. Yeah. And there are a lot of reasons to believe that this could be Beto's moment. Yeah. And the political landscape is filled with the carcasses of politicians who passed up a race because they didn't know when their moment was. And, you know, I think back a lot about um, something that Michelle Obama would tell undecided voters in Iowa. Uh, We would set when at the very end of the caucuses, they would at the end of every event, they would gather Mm. undecided caucus goers uh, to meet with the soon to be uh, first lady of the United States. And, a lot of these vote, these Iowans, li- they really liked Obama. They were so – they were fired up by, by him. They were inspired by him. But they didn't know if now was Obama's time. You know, and they also really liked Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or other people running. And they would say to the – they'd say to Mrs. Obama, you know, I, you know, I, I, I want to vote for, Obama, for Barack for president one day, right? But 
you know, maybe maybe I can vote for I can support Hillary now and then support Barack four or eight years from now. And Michelle would say to them that this this is Barack's moment. It will not be the same four or eight years from now. We'll be four or eight years removed from further removed from our lives as very normal people. We will be four or eight years more part of some sort of political establishment that this this is the moment for Brock. And yeah. the enthusiasm that you see for Beto O'Rourke that fueled his campaign, you see in the anticipation among a lot of people in the grassroots bottom running for president, there's no reason to believe that it will be there in four or eight years. And there's a lot of reason to believe it almost certainly won't be there for four, in four or eight years. Yeah. Now, I remember I remember those, those speeches she would give. Uh, uh, she'd say, we're normal now. We're still normal because <laughs> we haven't lived in Washington for that long. <laughs> and the longer you're in Washington, the less normal you become. Um, and, you know, Beto, even though he's been a three-term congressman now, he still has that sort of normalcy that comes with not having spent a ton of time in Washington. Stacey Abrams has the same thing. Andrew Gillum has the same thing. A lot of the other candidates. So um, I think that is something to consider. Um, Tom Chang Wei Lin asks, what can be done to take Mitch McConnell's seat in 2020? Our friend Mitch is up in 2020. What do we do? Well, a couple things here. One, let's stimulate it's Kentucky. So this will be hard. No doubt. Super hard. But, but... It, but Kentucky in a, in a presidential election year is different than Kentucky in a midterm year when McConnell won last. And in the time in, since McConnell last faced the ballot, he has become the face of everything that is wrong in American politics. And the, you know, this would be, you know, if my imaginary but very well funded super PAC were to become real. One of the things you would start doing is you would start advertising shortly in a two-year spread to try to inform the people of Kentucky about all the things that Mitch McConnell has done that hurt the people of Kentucky, whether it is the things he's done to sabotage the Affordable Care Act, where which has worked very, very well in Kentucky, at least until Republicans got in charge of that state. The the dramatic implications of the tax bill for working class and middle class Americans, the various scandals and corruptions that he has helped cover up because he 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 suffer. He has this advantage that he is the leader of a conservative state that is existing within a within both a local media bubble and a conservative media bubble that doesn't allow a lot of that information to get to him. So you'd want to start trying to soften him up now and start organizing now. There are pockets of unregistered voters in Kentucky that we could get. There are you can there's ne- the state has not has never been organized in the modern political era by Democrats in in any real aggressive way. And so it's something worth doing. And even if we were to try and fail, making Mitch McConnell sweat and having to focus on his own reelection yeah. instead of just his his daily tasks of destroying America would be a benefit to the republic. Looking at you, Amy McGrath. <laughs> Go for it. Um. Okay, Tojo Mama One Two One. <laughs> I think they just sent me these. You made it. I think Elijah, Elijah just sent me this up. so I could just say these names. Uh, it's, like, given it's the, Elijah's burner account. <laughs> given the difficulty that the Democrats have had in winning rural state Senate seats, is it feasible to win a majority in the Senate in 2020 without some drastic measures like turning the Dakotas into one <laughs> novel, novel, novel suggestion, or statehood for Puerto Rico? Um. Uh, what do you think? What do you think, Dan? It is it is possible to win the majority in 2020. We're going to have to have a lot of things go our way. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately for us, you know, it would have been easier had we been able to hang on to a couple more of those Democratic Senate seats, you know, particularly Florida and you know, either Missouri or Indiana. Um, that would have been – that would just made the math easier. But it is – it is. You have to sort of draw an inside straight in 2020 to do it. But okay, just so just so even people know, able- it, hold on. So we have, we probably end up with uh, Republicans will have 53 seats, unless you know, of course, there's a chance we win Mississippi and then it's 52 seats. But let's say, for argument's sake, it's 53 seats that they have. If Democrats win the presidency uh, in 2020, we need to flip three seats because then if it's tied, the vice president breaks the tie. Uh, if we don't win the presidency, we need to flip four seats. If we don't win the presidency, we have bigger problems than flipping four seats. Um, the targets in 2020, Colorado, 
Uh, that's probably the best target since it was a, it's a trending Democratic state. Uh, Iowa, North Carolina, Maine, outside shots, Arizona, Georgia, Texas again. Um, but we also have to hold on to Doug Jones' seat in Alabama, which would be really tricky. So that's sort of an overview of the map. The 2022 map is good because we left, we left some critical Senate seats on the table in 2016, shockingly enough, in states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, where we had other problems. Yeah. Um, but it, there is a larger point here, which is demographic trends and population movement trends in this country – make life hard for the Democrats in the long run in the Senate. As more young people move to urban areas in larger states, it just becomes hard to ever even sniff the 60 seats we briefly had at the beginning of the Obama presidency. Yeah. And so there, we do, we have a very, the Senate is a huge problem for the Democrats over the long term. Any situation in which Wyoming has as much power as California or Idaho has much power as New York, we're going to be in big trouble, which is why I have been an advocate for uh, a while of making D.C. a state, because I can fucking promise you that if D.C. voted like Utah, Mitch McConnell would have made it a state the second Donald Trump won the presidency. And you, if got, the you got Michael Rico, Martinez just, here just cheering again. He was he actually te- yeah. he texted me while we were talking. He said, last minute question for Dan from Michael in Los Angeles, who lived in D.C. for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then uh, if the people of Puerto Rico w- were to choose statehood as in as a path for uh, Puerto Rico, then. We should do that immediately as well. But in my mind, they they should choose whether it is independent statehood or whatever path they want. It's not something that D.C. should figure out for Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico should figure it out. D.C. should execute it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the people of D.C. should figure this out by themselves. Last time we talked about this, by the way, we talked about this in the political context. Some people said to us, you know, it's not just uh, to get Democratic votes. Like there's people who live in both D.C. and Puerto Rico who just do not have the type of representation that other American citizens have. And that in its own right is critically important to address aside from the political context. And my answer to that is yes, of course. (laughs) And that's why, like you you said, it's it's up to the people of the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico to decide this for themselves, you know. But if they want to become uh, states, then they should become states. Yeah. I'm trying to light a fire under the Democratic Party to do this because the moral – Kate in substantive case for making DC a state has been around for a long fucking time and we haven't done anything. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying a different tack, but that is the exact right reason I say that as a off and on 20 year resident of Washington, DC. Um, Tara Dunch asks, I live in Australia and here voting is mandatory and we also have a preferential system and I'm interested on people's thoughts for that type of system. I was talking to uh, someone who was going to work for um, a recently elected Democrat. And they're asking me for what the – like what would be your boldest idea to improve democracy? And my answer was mandatory voting. Hmm. I mean it's I, – I guess I haven't really thought too much about mandatory voting. Like I love the idea that everyone's automatically registered and everyone gets a ballot in the mail – so that it is the easiest thing possible. I can't tell how I feel about going the extra step of forcing people to sort of exercise what is a right and a freedom where there's some responsibility attached. Um, you know, like, I just, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. But, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly for every single step to make voting as easily, as easy as humanly possible. National holiday, automatic voter registration for everyone 18 or older you know, ma- ballots that come in the mail so it's easier to uh, to vote, all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure about mandatory voting. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this question. Mm. Do you, is is it mandatory that you pay taxes? It is, it is. Is that your, is that your, in exchange for the benefits that you get for being a citizen of the United States, you're required to give a portion of your income to the federal and state and city governments of the United States, correct? Yes, yes, I am. So it doesn't seem that crazy that we should ask you to, once every two years or so to I would to fill out a piece of paper that we mail to your house t- 
telling us your preferences for elected officials and policies in this country. Now, I think if you do this, you have to, the only way to do it is to ensure that there's a none of the above option because you shouldn't be forced to choose between three candidates if you don't right. like three candidates or four candidates or two, whatever it is, right? Yeah. So you should be able to say none of the above or write someone in. But I think that there is a, I think there would be something very healthy for democracy if people believed that if if they had to engage in it, right? It was mm-hmm. not a choice to engage in it. You had actually had to do it. It wouldn't take very much time. And I haven't fully explored this issue. I'd like to hear the counter arguments other than – Yeah. I can't even imagine. Like, I'd like to hear what the counter arguments are other than like just people screaming false flags and big government. Like what's the actual – right reason against it and i think i think it is interesting it has worked you know it has worked in australia as i understand it not perfectly but it has worked and i'd love to see a state experiment with it and to do it you have to allow there to be none of the above and two you have to make it as easily as easy as humanly possible you can't force someone to take a day off work to do it no 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 to find child care for their children or whatever the reason that may that we make voting so fucking hard in this country but if everyone could do it uh you know, it with a mail in ballot, or, or and this sounds crazy. I'd actually suggest that we get our heads around voting on the internet from your phone, which you carry with you every day and put all kinds of terribly uh, personal and compromising information into. Uh, but like, make it super easy for people and yeah. it would, to see, see what it would do for people, not just turnout, obviously, which would <laughs> go up, but how people just sort of have people's engagement in, dem- in their government writ large. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell us your thoughts on this. I'd like to hear more. You make you make good points, Dan. Um, Hugh Scully asks, "What policies can Democrats pursue to help tame the growing plutocracy and deal with the diminution of middle class careers available to American workers? What does a 21st century New Deal really look like? Fifteen dollar minimum wage, job guarantee, Green New Deal, where you put people to work building energy efficient infrastructure, Medicare for all, universal skills and education program, debt free college." Breaking up monopolies, the monopolies of uh, of this day and age. What else you got, Dan? You answered that question better than every single – that is a version of the question we have asked almost every single Democratic politician who has been on the podcast. Like, well, let me tell you about you, the challenges of globalization. How do you deal with the forces of automation and globalization that are undermining the middle-class bargain in America? And then they just kind of go, bleh, bleh. Oh, My priority is it, the middle class. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We, okay. Give we us some work policies, hard for the guys. Working class. Give us some tangible policies. I want some ideas. Yeah, I, I, all those things are right. I think this is what has to be a major centerpiece of the Democratic, the conversation around the Democratic presidential primary. Let's have a debate. Let's let's have people put forward really creative ideas. And frankly, the in the run up to the Democratic presidential primary. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and Kamala Harris, and Kirsten Gillibrand have all put forward some really interesting policy proposals around yeah. the economy and government reform that I think are have moved the ball forward. And I hope we keep that process up until we have we have a standard bear. Yeah, no, for sure, they've done a great job. The, the people you mentioned in, in putting forward new policies, and there's an episode of The Wilderness all about this, uh, about big economic policies, and like you know the ones I just mentioned. It, they're all on sort of the the bolder, the bigger bolder side of the spectrum, and I realize that as I just said that. But I do think, and like you said, you know, people can debate that, and they can debate, can we afford this? Can we afford that? Does this really work? But I think that we should start from a place where we are thinking as big and bold as possible, and then work from there, as opposed to starting from a place where we're talking about piecemeal incremental stuff um, and worrying about whether we can get it passed. Let's think big first. And then uh, figure out how to get it done once we get power. Um, Jeremy Levine asks, John Lovett talks all the time about Fox News as a propaganda apparatus. What options do we have to actually combat Fox News? Is there a way to dismantle it, limit it somehow? Or do we just have to continue to saturate the media market with our message? I have been curious about policy proposals to deal not with Fox News specifically, but to deal with um, corporate monopolies in media. Um, and I, I don't know the answers to that, but I'm 
I, I'm sort of ex- trying to explore those because I'm very curious about the things that have changed, like the the regulatory changes have been made in the last two decades, and then how what how that has contributed to the things like Sinclair being able to own large portions of American television markets and and pump propaganda into them. So I'm very curious about that. There is not a world in which uh, Fox just. There's not a world in which Fox just disappears, or there's something we can do to stop it. I the I probably put three things that we can be doing. First is I think we should continue to do what the folks at Sleeping Giants have been doing, and put pressure on the corporations that advertise on Fox News. Right. Yeah. So, well, you know, these cor- many of these corporations have made uh, they have they have statements promoting diversity and and fighting racism and all of these things, and yet they are taking their dollars and they are spending them on what you know Lovett would refer to as the white nationalist variety hour in the evening. And I think that there could, there's some opportunity to get some of these uh, corporations to feel pressure at least for doing that. So that's one. Two, Democrats have to come up with communication strategies to, you know, as this person said in the question, saturate those markets. Like what we can't – I don't think there's a role in which Democrats can use Fox to reach Fox viewers. Yeah. I but agree. we have to find ways to reach Fox viewers that go around Fox. And I think that is primarily going to be done through both digital advertising and using uh, – in, uh, in a form of digital organizing where you empower – you build new tools to empower people – to share content and messaging with people in their social networks, you know, either in their contact list or on their Facebook feed or wherever else. So that like, we know that you're not going to pierce the Fox news bubble by, you know, an ad from a Democrat necessarily, or, uh, you know, video of Barack Obama speaking, or even something from the New York times or CNN, you're going to do that by taking a piece of content and having shared by a trusted member of their existing information bubble. And so there's a lot of really important work that I think is starting but needs to advance quickly about how we do that because you know as I've as we've said before Fox is one of the is the most insidious force in American politics in the last 20 years and is responsible for most of what is wrong with in American politics because it has created the this um, alternative propaganda apparatus that is trying to divide Americans around racial lines. Yeah. And look, we uh, and we have to build up a progressive media ecosystem of our own. Um, it's pro- you know, love it would probably yell at me for saying this, but more more crooked media is out there. <laughs> um, like right now, it's us, and you know the Young Turks have been around for a long time, and you've got some hosts on MSNBC. That's all I'll say, it's not because it's certainly not the whole network. Um, but you've got you know. <laughs> Uh, Chris yeah, Hayes, our, a good. Our progressive... version of Fox News gave a show to Hugh Hewitt. So right. Yeah. Like, what the fuck are we doing? Right. Exactly. We have. Yeah. We basically we have like Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow and 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 I guess sometimes Chris Matthews and Lawrence O'Donnell, <laughs> and you know they all do great works. But again, even the purpose of their shows is not explicitly activist or partisan, right? So I would love, uh, I would love more uh, folks out there in the progressive media ecosystem. Um, okay. Um, D. Charles asked, now that the midterms are over, how can people get, stay involved and work towards change in 2020? Um, obviously everyone's going to be focused on the presidential campaign. Um, and you know, you can, you should get excited about that too and figure out which candidate you support and go work for that candidate or volunteer for that candidate. But I just want people to remember, like, let's not make the mistake that we made all through the Obama years and focus only on the top of the ticket or focus too much on the top of the ticket and not remember that we have, you know, an entire House of Representatives up for re-election again in two years. And we have the Senate races we just mentioned. And again, we have down ballot races, state legislatures, um, state houses to flip, secretary of state races in these states, which are hugely important. So um, there are so many campaigns um, and places to get involved. And there's also going to be issues to get involved around, ballot referendum. So there are no shortage of places to get involved. What do you, what do you think, Dan? Yeah, that is, that's exactly right. Like, we won an election, and that is awesome. And we probably saved American democracy from imploding on itself because if Republicans had been able to keep power, who knows what the fuck would have happened. But let's not forget, Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell are still going to spend – Every waking moment they have trying to fuck up America. And we're going to have, there are going to be big fights, just like there were in the first two years of the Trump presidency to, 
you know, push back on the Muslim ban or to try to save DACA or to save the Affordable Care Act. I, I would be, I would play some real money that we're going to have to do some real activism work to save the Mueller investigation in the coming months. Trump mm. is going to try to undo protections for transgendered Americans. They are going to try to, um, you know, they just like, for example, Betsy DeVos um, just Put in place new rules that make it harder for a uh, victim to sexual assault to come forward and on, on college campuses. And so there, mm-hmm. like, there are horrible things happening. But we're going to have to marshal the energy that we put behind the midterms to fight back on. And it it is going to keep coming. And I know it's tiring. And everyone gets this week off. And then we got to fucking we got to get back to it next week with Mike Espy's election, the runoff in Georgia for the Secretary of State's race, where if John Barrow wins that race, the Democrat, think about that. It'll be, you, instead of having someone like Brian Kemp running elections, putting in place Jim Crow era voter suppression policies, you would have a Democrat who was trying to ex- make it, you have a Democrat who is trying to expand the vote, to make it so that everyone has the right to vote. What a difference that would make in that state. That's the difference between winning and losing. That might have the potential to move Georgia very quickly into a into the purple column and give us a chance to win that or win that Senate seat. And so there's all, well, there are going to be 100 battles that matter. And we had a very important win on Tuesday, last Tuesday, but we have a lot more work to do. There are going to be all kinds of places to get involved, both in elections in 2019, presidential campaigns in 2019, and activism to push back on Trump's policy atrocities in 2019. Absolutely. Uh, Alex Greenberg, had Hillary won in 2016, would there be a crooked media? What the hell would you all be doing these days? And secondly, would any of you ever work on another campaign or White House? Great question. I don't know if there would be a crooked media. I hope there would be. I do know that I was getting tired of Uh, not being in politics. (laughs) And so even before uh, Trump won, I was thinking that I missed politics. I was spending all my time in my other job on Twitter, as I do today. And so I figured if I'm going to be on Twitter all day and paying attention to politics all all day, I might as well make it a job. Um, And for a long time, as you've heard on this podcast, all of us have had critiques of the way Uh, political media operates today so we've always had that critique and always hoped that there would be some alternative progressive alternative um to the way uh the media the political media operates uh so maybe we would have but i don't know um and would any of you ever work on another campaign or the white house boy i don't think so (laughs) i mean it is just i don't i don't know what it would take but i think right now i'm 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 very happy here at uh at Crooked Media, and I think that we could play a helpful role um, to the next uh, the next Democratic presidential candidate and all other Democratic candidates. So I think we play a good role, a helpful role from here. But I don't know. What do you think, Dan? Um, I this is a really hard question because, like this, this is sort of the ball game for everything we care about is mm. this twenty twenty election yeah. and. I generally think that campaigns are best served by hiring people who are up and coming and new and unburdened by the experiences of being in politics for a long time. I think we benefited greatly in 2008 that most of us were at the early stages of our career and we were – We were the upstarts, not the establishment. And so I suspect that the best presidential campaign, the the best presidential campaigns in 2020 are the people who are going to have the next David Plouffe, the next Alyssa Mastromonaco, the next John Favreau working for them and not (laughs) the current John Favreau, either you (laughs) or the Iron Man guy. Um, The has been John Favreau. and, And so, but. You know, if there was ever a way in which we, you know, more likely in the White House in a campaign could be helpful, yeah. you know, then you'd certainly have to feel – you know, if, if you found the right person that you believed in who you could make a, tr- a true difference and fix this fucking mess that we are currently in, I think you got to at least think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I hear that. And it's tough because you you, know, you never know now uh, until it actually – the opportunity presents itself. Um, Mary Can I say Jane- one other thing about yeah. the crooked media question? Sure. You, you point out that we have a uh, critique of the media that we've had. Yes. My new thing for 2019 is going to be my critique of the critique of the media. <laughs> wow, meta. 
Yeah, it's very it's very meta, but I, I've come around. I have a whole new view on this that we can discuss in a in a different pod. But okay, uh, I'll take you I, up on that. I, I think I think I figured out that the best strategy for Democrats to win the White House is not to send as many tweets at New York Times reporters as possible. I completely agree with that. I do. And look, we this is like you know self policing here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when i tweet at them i do it as a subscriber not no. as a disgruntled subscriber well look, not if, as a democratic operative if a democratic candidate for president sat down with me and was like what advice uh on media would you give me i'd be like uh ignore all the bullshit like stay off twitter get your staff to stay off twitter like don't worry about these fucking daily crises that disappear after a couple hours and the fighting that's going on in Washington and the like just I mean we've talked about this um last episode when we talked about sort of like a candidate who can command a media ecosystem that is separate from Donald Trump's but it's not just separate from Donald Trump's it's sort of separate from the sort of political media landscape that we have ecosystem that we have right now like you've somehow got to get outside of that and get your message directly to voters by meeting them, by um, talking to them through different social media platforms. Like there has to be a way to not get in the scrum <laughs> right now. Um, okay, Mary Jane Pfeiffer. Any relationship? Um, uh, how do you spell it? It's yeah, yeah. yeah here it is. It's P H I F E R. So no, it's a much simpler way of doing it. Yeah, that no. is that is a much. Mute. Um, Pumpkin or pecan pie, stuffing or dressing, best table game to play after the meal. Go. St- stuffing, pumpkin pie, and what's a table game? I guess just a game that you play after Thanksgiving. What's your favorite game to play after Thanksgiving? We we watch football. That's what okay. We do. Um, like I, I don't know who plays. Is that a thing people do? Like, has my family just been? Have I been deprived my whole life? Yeah. Of playing we, games? Oh yeah, we Dude. always play games. What do you play? Uh, so the best game to play now. Uh, that I am married to Emily is Salad Bowl, which Emily taught us. Uh, everyone can go look it up, but you you write words on little pieces of paper. You put them in a bowl. There's three rounds. The first round, you get people to guess by giving all kinds of verbal clues that aren't the word. The second round is charades. And the third round is password, so you only can say one word to get people to guess the uh, word. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, huh. And I, I like... I didn't even know that was a thing, that people a, played games. I guess yeah, you know. my family's weird. Um, stuffing for me, for sure. Stuffing's like my favorite side dish. And um, pecan pie. Big fan of that. Um, all right. Last one. Carl Miner, please just run through like 10 really positive things that we can be thankful for this year. So much yuck. <laughs> yes, Carl, there has been a lot of yuck. Um, but things to be <laughs> thankful for. We saved Obamacare. Many states expanded Medicaid. The Democrats won the House. We won seven governorships. Turnout among young people was up, and the margin among young people and people all the way up to 40 swung hugely Democratic. Amendment 4 passed in Florida, so 1.5 million people who were formerly incarcerated have the right to vote. Um, what else? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the candidates who won, friends of the pod, especially people who were f- all the firsts, um, Sharice Davids, Lucy McBath, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, Abby Finkenhauer, Chrissy Houlihan. Uh, Katie Porter, the minimum wage passed in Missouri, the Beto Abrams and Gillum campaigns. And just to end on this, like I, I'm also incredibly grateful to all of you, um, you know, in the most uh, in the diciest moments of this election, uh, when my anxiety was high, which it often is uh, because I worry about everything, though I, I do panic about nothing. Um, and whenever I'd be annoyed by something on Twitter or some poll or worried about this or that or Trump, um, every time people um, who listen to this podcast tweeted at us, sent us pictures of themselves knocking on doors, organizing, telling us that they were going out to you know knock on doors for the first time, make phone calls, um, you know, it li- it lifted my spirits. And I know that um, for a lot of friends of the pod they've made friends with other friends at the pod. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very grateful for this community of people who, you know, um, tell us when we're wrong, push us to do better, and have decided to um, participate in politics. You've all made an incredible difference this year, and you should be very proud of that and very thankful. So that's how yeah. I'll end. You 
you saved America, at least for the time being. And yeah. that would not have happened without all, all the people who listened to our podcast, who got involved for the first time, who knocked doors, who ran for office. Yeah. You know, it's really, it is, uh, we're, we're very lucky. And, you know, people sometimes say to us, you helped keep it. Pod Save America helps keeps us sane. And I always point, but that it, it's actually the, it's a two way street because being able to talk about politics with all of you keeps us sane too. That is absolutely correct. All right, Dan. Um, when we come back, uh, you will hear my interview with Doris Kearns Goodwin. 